Hi everyone, my name is Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia, and today once again I'm joined by my brother Brian and partner at As Good As Gold, and today we interview John Adams, Chief Economist at As Good As Gold Australia. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Daryl and Brian. How are you going today? Excellent, thank you. Very well, thank you, John. Um, John, we have an event coming up, a GFC 2.0, next big drop, of course. Um, We've got three events coming up and they are almost full. So we've got Melbourne, just over a week's time, 27th of this month. A week later, we've got Sydney and just over a week after that, and just prior to the election, we've got an Adelaide event coming up as well. So once again, almost full, uh, in fact, but we do have, we've got a few seats left and we do have a couple of seats left for the Melbourne dinner. Uh, which is in a private banquet room, of course. Um, so lots to look forward to, but just wondering if you could just share some thoughts with our viewers at the moment. Tell them a little bit about this event, John, and what they might expect to hear. So, so I think uh, quite a few people in the audience would have, uh, you know, I mean, they would have heard uh, you know, uh, me on several platforms uh, with you guys and with Martin North and uh, you know, Reluctant Preppers and a few others and, uh, quite a few people would have seen a number of my articles. So, uh, you know, I've been warning about an economic crisis for the last uh, four years publicly. Uh, we're starting to see some of the beginning signs of that in this country with uh, house price declines, uh, rising unemployment in New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, a lot of people, particularly in Melbourne, struggling with debt. Um, so, so it looks like the, the, the first signals of the debt, uh, debt bubble coming to, uh, coming to a systemic sort of uh, position. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously when we did the uh, seminar last October in Adelaide, it was uh, explaining the real position of the Australian economy and to, you know, work through the audience about how to prepare for a um, systemic event. Uh, you know, the basic thesis is we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the country. At the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. So, uh, you know, with the events coming up next week and then in Sydney and Adelaide, it's to uh, you know really bring the audience up to speed. Well, where where is this uh, sort of bubble up to? Uh, what are the risks to uh, ordinary Australians? Uh, how people should think about preparing uh, uh, in terms of how do, how do, how do they should uh, get into shape uh, financially around this? Um, um, and, and obviously, you know, you know, given that we are a gold and silver dealership, talking about the role of gold and silver, um, uh, basically in that context. Uh, you know, I mean, I have. Uh, I wrote an article for news.com last year about a 10-step ten, ten, uh, ten plan of how to prepare. And uh, in the last few months, I've taken you know, quite a few strong, decisive actions to, to basically get myself ready. So I think I'm almost ready uh, for the crisis. And I'll explain to the audience about what I've personally done uh, to get ready, uh, very consistent with my 10-step plan and how can they uh, prepare for, for what's to come. Yes, we're... Uh... These, these events have always been received well. Uh, I did mention earlier that um, in this presentation that we do have a dinner coming up in Melbourne. Sydney's booked out, by the way. It was booked out uh, about a week after we launched it. Um, but Melbourne, still a couple of seats left. That's an opportunity for any attendees to um, get to know As Good As Gold Australia and John Adams uh, a little better in a in a dining environment, a private room, should be fantastic. Really looking forward to this. Um, yeah, so uh, lots to look forward to. Living in very uncertain times, John. I thought today, I thought today what we might do is something a little different. I thought the timing was very appropriate. So I thought what we might do is go back, if we could, late 1920s, early 1930s, leading up to World War II where a misallocation of capital in similar times to now, very uncertain environment, led to a rather disastrous financial outcome for a very famous family in Austria. So major ramifications from this. So I thought we could illustrate it best if we went back to 1965, and everyone is going to remember this, uh, a film, The Sound of Music, premiered pretty much all at the same time all around the world. I don't know anyone who hasn't seen the film, uh, 
Brian? I, I've seen it about five times. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've seen great it. Great film. Absolutely I think great I've film. seen it 105 times. Um, and most people I speak to, it's a sound of music, of course. Now, the storyline, it starts in Austria. Maria, Julie Andrews, who was, um, who's very famous, of course, now, assigned the job of looking after the Von Trapp children. Now, this is, the, the set is on, uh, it's a beautiful home. It's a mansion. Uh, wonderful estate overlooking a lake and from there George von Trapp and the children fall in love with Maria as she does them and they are obsessed with their with singing and hence the sound of music so interestingly enough however the storyline in this movie is quite different to what really happened um, and we think that it's relevant, that this story is very relevant, and a lesson we can learn from this is very relevant today. So what I'd like you to do, John, if you could, is share the real story of Maria Augusta Cochera, Captain George Von Trapp, and his delightful family. If you could do that, be very appreciative. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously everyone loves the sound of music. I mean, I was brought up as a kid watching it on TV. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, about uh, four or five months ago, I saw a clip on YouTube about the real story about the Von Trapps. Um, and, and, and the real story is actually very different to what, what happened in the movie. Uh, and, and, and the parallels to today were, were, were very stark. So, um, you know, so, so, so basically uh, the captain became a widow in uh, 1922. Um, uh, and basically Maria was sent, um, and I think about 1925, 1926, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the Von Trapp mansion. Um, now, uh, in the movie, it is portrayed that she uh, effectively goes uh, just before World War II to see the children of the captain. Uh, that didn't actually happen. Uh, so it happened in the 20s. Um, uh, the captain and Maria got married in 1927. So uh, now, the... the, the the captain uh, was was an aristocrat. Now, uh, his first wife was actually extremely wealthy, um, and, and so the captain um, and 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 the first wife um, who, who who died of cancer in 1922, uh, they, they had a lot of wealth. Now, and they lived like aristocrats. They had they had a mansion, and the mansion in Salzburg was obviously featured in the film. Um, uh, and, and and they had servants. They had uh, a very privileged lifestyle. Um, so, but but the interesting thing with the captain was. Uh, other than the mansion, which was the real estate, uh, the rest of the family fortune was in the Austrian banks. So he basically had basically put all of his eggs in, uh, in terms of the single in, in one basket. So uh, when the Great Depression happened, so uh, a lot of people think that the Great Depression happened in October of 1929 with the crash of the uh, stock market. But what really caused the depression, particularly in Europe, was, was when the Austrian banks went belly up in 1931. And, and, and the issue for the Von Trapps was that they were one of those victims that had all of their money um, in the banking system. Um, and basically the captain lost everything except for the mansion. Now, uh, by, by the time of the Great Depression just after, uh, you know, the captain and Maria had three of their own children. So all together by the, by the, you know, by the Great Depression, they had 10 children. So uh, in the mansion, uh, they, they ended up having to, basically live on the third floor uh, and they had to rent out the rest of the mansion just so that they could um, survive because other than the, the property, they hadn't, uh, they, they basically had nothing. So that they had to sack all the uh, servants, the, the maids, the butlers. Um, and it was a very frugal lifestyle was, and they were very unaccustomed to it. Didn't see any, didn't see any of that in the movie, John. <laughs> no. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously if you remember, uh, when they were planning their escape uh, and they went to the uh, Salzburg Music Festival, uh, I mean, I mean, the butler, w w the butler was still in the mansion. The butler in the movie was the one who told the Nazis that they were planning to escape. Um, so, but, 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 that, but that, that didn't actually happen in real life. So, um, uh, so uh, yeah, they, they had a, um, now in the movie that there was a, like a guy, a character called Uncle Max, who was uh, the, the uh, character encouraging the children to sing at the formal choir, or there was a, a local Catholic priest who was a music director, um, and, and after the Great Depression uh, in, the, in the early 30s, uh, was uh, working with Marie and the children around singing. 
um, uh, and basically was uh, pushing the children to uh, sing quite heavily. Uh, and, and there were certain uh, friends of the Von Trapps who, who uh, you know, who, who commented that the Von Trapp children, um, um, you know, sang very well. So Maria actually saw a opportunity for the children to become a professional choir um, and that they could sing for money. Now, the captain was, was against that because, uh, you know, he thought that uh, them being aristocrats, they shouldn't sing for money. They should sing because of, uh, well, you know, I mean, they, they shouldn't sing in public. They shouldn't sing for money. They should sing privately. Um, and he really didn't think that it was beneath them to, to, to sort of push these things, uh, you know, to push out this sort of culture for, in terms of money. But uh, having, having been cash strapped uh, and Maria uh, pushing the captain, he basically said that they, you know, he sort of caved in and they had no option. So they ended up uh, going into the Salzburg Music Festival in, I think, 1936. They won the competition. Um, and basically from there, they became one of the leading choirs in all of Europe. Um, and then on the verge of um, uh, World War II, uh, you know, so, so the Nazis, just like in the movie, uh, did request the captain uh, to come into the German Navy. And he was an Austrian nationalist, so he was against that. But uh, they actually wanted the Von Trapps to come and sing for Hitler's birthday. Uh, and they were completely against uh, Hitler and the Nazis um, and what they stood for. Uh, and the Von Trapps were a very deep religious Christian family um, uh, and they basically said there was no way they were going to sing for Hitler. So, so, uh, so, so from there they decided to escape Austria um, and, and rather than climbing over the Alps like they did at the end of the movie they hopped on a train uh, and they went to Italy. From Italy they went to London uh, and then from London they went off to the United States. Uh, by the time they got to the US they were basically penniless um, and it took them many years to re-establish, um, you know, in, in terms of establishing their career, establishing, you know, a, a basic home for them. Um, but, uh, but, but after a number of years, they were able, through quite a bit of struggle, they established the Von Trapp uh, Family Singers. Uh, that was their formal stage name in the US, uh, and, they, and they became quite successful. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, the, the captain went on to, you know, pass away in the 50s. And after he passed away, the sort of... Um, the family sort of fell apart and the children sort of went their own ways. And Maria in real life w was very different to Julie Andrews in the movie. Um, you know, could be kind, but very, uh, very short tempered um, and, and really pushed the children hard. And the children, as they grew into adults, really resented, um, uh, you know, what Maria sort of uh, w was trying to do. But, uh, but, but yeah, but, 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 you know, when I looked at this, I thought to myself, well, wow, um, here you have, uh, someone on the verge of the Great Depression uh, put all of these eggs in one basket, putting it all in the banks, um, uh, and he lost it all. Um, uh, and, and, and in reality, uh, the Von Trapp family never covered financially from that, uh, for, like in terms of that one decision. Um, and, and you know, I mean that that sort of you know rang um, you know a couple of alarm bells in my mind in terms of well, you know, when you go into a financial crisis, particularly in an environment where you've got high levels of debt. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of systemic risk in the financial system. Um, you know, uh, there are examples in history where you, if you play your cards right, well, not only have you set up yourself for, for the rest of your life, but you set off, you know, you set up the, you know, you know the, the, next, the next one or two generations um, uh, and you can create a dynasty. Um, and, you know, one example of that could be uh, former uh, Victorian Premier Ted Bailey. I mean, the Bailey family uh, made a fortune in the 1892 Depression. Um, uh, and they became extremely wealthy. They played their cards right. Uh, and 100 years later, one of their heirs, uh, you know, was elected to the highest uh, public office in Victoria. But in the case of the Von Trapps, uh, that, that they became a victim. They made a mistake. Um, uh, and they basically um, sort of suffered quite heavily uh, throughout the 30s. Uh, and by the time they got to get to America, they basically had no money left. So you know, uh, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, I, and I'm happy to say this publicly. So in, in the context of uh, what I've done with my family, consistent with the article I wrote for news.com last year, uh, I don't have all of my eggs in one basket. I don't have, uh, do I have some money in the banks? I do, uh, but the majority of my money is outside of the banks uh, because of the level of risk that I see um, not only with the Australian banking system, but, but with, the, uh, with, the, with the global banking system as well. So, so I think there are some uh, very uh, um, good and interesting parallels that we should draw between the real story of the Von Trapps uh, mm. and, uh, and, and what we see here today. Yeah, well, I've just listed here 
Um, and I like your comment, all eggs in one basket. I mean, they had all their money, all of it in the bank. The bank, uh, bank experiences a collapse. They lose all their money and they're left pretty much destitute. Uh, quite different, the story, of course, that we are led to believe took place in the movie. But I guess it gets down once again to balance port, well it does, it gets down to a balanced portfolio. And a lot of people talk about that, it just rolls off the tongue, balanced portfolio. But what we find is that most people don't have a balanced portfolio. They are either all in to real estate, they're all into stocks, or they're all into the bond market. But it's the furthest thing from balanced. Uh, and Jim Rickards makes reference to this all the time, which is why he talks about a 10% investment in gold. Um, uh, holding 10% of your net worth, shall we say, in gold. Because the other markets tend to do the same thing. So if, if the stock market experiences a major downturn, then you can pretty much expect the bond market is going to react the same, the real estate market is going to react the same way. So a 10% holding in precious metals will could quite, quite comfortably uh, cover the losses that you've made in the, in the other markets. So balanced portfolio really important, which is what George didn't have. And this gentleman, Ray Dalio, I've got, I've got to bring this to everyone's attention. Ray Dalio, uh, Brian is a great supporter of this man. But it says, he says, everyone should consider a five to 10% allocation to gold as a hedge. If you do have an excellent analysis of why you shouldn't have uh, such an allocation to gold, we'd appreciate you sharing it with us. I mean, how confident can you be? So this man's got a net worth of $18.4 billion. He's saying five to 10%. If you don't, believe, if you don't think so, let me know why. So I find that that's the issue with most people. Most people don't understand precious metals and it doesn't represent a portion of their portfolio. Brian? Yeah, the, the story is incredible because it's all based on the fact that all the eggs were in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> and you find, and so the real estate he may have had was a good investment, but uh, having uh, all of his extra money in the bank, which I think was the um, Austrian bank credit as So in 1931, that went broke. Uh, obviously, the bank had not diversified enough through, uh, and of course, in, incorporated fractional reserve banking in, in in the banking system. So. They were just uh, like everybody else. They all had their, the bank had all of its extra money loaned out, didn't have any gold, didn't have any silver, and therefore they went broke. And the, the, uh, the owners, or sorry, the, uh, uh, the clients of that, of that bank also went broke. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a couple of other points, John. Um, what's really interesting to me is we insure houses, our house, our cars, our boats, our health. And yet when it comes to our financial future, we fail to do so. And this is the Jim Rickards Ray Dalio issue again, 10%. It's a form of insurance. Uh, it doesn't come any better than that. How do you see it? So, so I agree, you know, that, that gold and silver, you know, it, so, so it is it's a hedge. And, and, and you know, look, uh, one, one of the things that I continually hear across the country is people believe that gold and silver is a form of investment. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the reasons why that is, is because the tax code by the Australian tax office says that, um, uh, that, that, that you could be sort of earning uh, a capital gain or a capital loss, uh, you know, if you hold gold or silver bullion, but, uh, you know, the, the traditional role of, of gold and silver has been money. So, you know, there's a whole host of Australians sitting on cash, uh, whether it's a smaller amount or a big amount, some of them have it in the bank, some of it have it, um, um, have it in sort of outside in physical form. But, uh, you know, uh, what you're holding is you're holding the government's money. Um, and, 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 you know, and people feel very confident about holding the Australian dollar uh, because they've been, from, from being kids, they've been taught that this is money uh, and, and this should be safe. Well, um, uh, every currency in history that is unbacked uh, and it's a fair currency 
the value is determined by the state, by the government, uh, that, you know, the politicians and the bureaucrats for the last thousand years have printed too much of it um, and basically it, you know, creates massive amounts of inflation. Uh, the, the currency turns to confetti uh, and people lose confidence in using that currency um, uh, in terms of, you know, a store of wealth or in terms of uh, transactional value. So, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I, you know, gold and silver, it is, it is a form of money. Um, uh, it shouldn't be seen as, uh, you know, it, in, that you are investing um, and that if you are, um, you know, wanting to, to keep your money in some sort of, uh, or, or keep your wealth in sort of, some sort of money form, um, well, uh, you know, if it is a hedge, well, what are you hedging against? You're hedging against uh, economic mismanagement. And, uh, you know, just look at what we've done in this country. Uh, you know, official interest rates are one and a half percent. A reserve bank saying they're ready to launch quantitative easing. Um, you know, you, you have the banking system that has uh, uh, created enormous sums of uh, credit uh, and given it out to households on very uh, dodgy uh, um, um, uh, terms as, determined, as, as revealed in the Royal Commission. Um, you have ever increasing amounts of, 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 of debt in terms of in terms of state government debt, in terms of federal government debt, uh, you have a budget which says that we're going to go into a surplus, but but the assumptions behind the uh, the, the assumptions that uh, Josh Frydenberg put in the budget, a lot of them are completely fraudulent. And you know I'm happy to say I've spoken to uh, two members of the coalition in the last uh, fortnight, and I said your government committed mass fraud in terms of the budget you put out because a number of the assumptions um, you know uh, don't hold water. Um, and, and, and it could be very well argued that some of these assumptions are just uh, over-exaggerated. Um, and particularly if um, we, we start to see uh, the, you know, the economy continuing to weaken uh, the housing market, or if we see a global shock because of something blows up overseas, well, uh, we know that you know, if, if, if the short and government comes in, they will launch fiscal stimulus. Uh, they, yeah. will try, they will print, they will spend. Um, and so the hedge is uh, against this sort of of reckless uh, fiscal and monetary policy, which we know for thousands of years has degraded the value of fiat currencies. So, 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 so that's obviously the hedge. And uh, you know, I mean, obviously, and it just going back to the von Trapps. I mean, uh, had they had uh, gold and silver um, outside of the banking system, uh, they would not have been destitute in the uh, in the 30s. Uh, the children would not have had to sing. Now, I think they did enjoy the singing, but uh, and we were the benefit of they're seeing it then obviously with the movie, but that wouldn't have happened. But also when they had to flee to the United States uh, after the Nazis uh, sort of uh, were on the verge of World War II, uh, you know, had they had some gold or, or silver with them, they would have been uh, able to uh, reestablish their life in the United States on a much more uh, sustainable and comfortable basis. And yet they went through years of hardship. So, well, you know, the Von Trapp family, the, the, bon, the Von Trapp story is that, uh, if you play your cards wrong in a major economic uh, uh, sort of uh, collapse or, or crisis, uh, it can have lifelong consequences um, um, and you may not be able to financially recover. Yeah, well, that, that point stood out very strongly to me. I had listed here holding physical gold. Yeah, you're right, 100%. Um, I know they didn't track through the Austrian Alps or anything like that, but they did catch a train and it would have been so easy for them to transfer another form of money, gold, uh, with them to the United States. And you're right, 100%, it would have set them up uh, a lot differently um, in the process. So I guess it gets back to Jim Sinclair. If you, if you want to put all of your money into the bank, why not your bank? Why not you become your own central bank? I love the way he quotes that. Become your own central bank you have the holding, you're in control. And that's exactly where the Von Trapps would have been had they hurled physical gold at the time. It just would have changed, the, the storyline would have changed dramatically. Um, yeah, um, and, and reference to Peter Daniels, and I keep making this comment, but um, Peter says, or said, and has said many times, it doesn't matter what happens in the world tonight, it's irrelevant, because uh, I'll be able to party tomorrow. And the Von Trapps could have done exactly the same thing if they'd have held precious metals outside of the banking system, which is exactly what my mentor has done. So, um, yeah, some really strong points here. And it would have changed that storyline dramatically if, if George had been 
uh, alert to that. You've got a, another comment there I think yeah, you want to make, right? The, in conclusion, from all the, the stories of the Von Trapps and, uh, and other people in that, in that sort of predicament, I, uh, Daryl's already mentioned Ray Dalio. Um, in my seminars, I, go, I cover about four or five billionaires. Um, but I relate to the one of the richest in the world, and some people, a lot of people don't know how well they are, uh, how well off they are. But the Jacob, the Rothschilds family is recognised as one of the wealthiest families. And even they said in 2016, or Jacob Rothschild said in 2016, I'm increasing my exposure in the precious metal by 8%. So, you know, if people like this are looking at their exposure to gold and silver, you just take it from the leaders of the country, of the world. Um, di directly with reference to uh, the, um, to the uh, sound of music, um, I look at the fact that you should all your, always try and own your own home or have a very, very tiny mortgage, certainly before this recession hits. Own your own gold. Do not go out and borrow money to buy gold. So own your own gold. And while you're saving to buy the gold, save in silver to buy the productive assets and reframe from borrowing. So always save in, in, in silver because it's the cheapest form and then convert that silver over to uh, good productive assets and some of those assets would be gold. Good work, Brian. Um, I guess at this point, John, any closing comments on that? You know, one, one of the key points to make is... Um, after the global financial crisis, the, the, in terms of the banks, but the, in terms of the regulators, like the, the Bank for International Settlements, they actually have changed the, the definition in terms of what it, what it means to put your money in the bank in terms of having a deposit. So most Australians believe that putting your money in the bank, I mean, the bank is the custodian of your money. Well, since the GFC, uh, what they've said a deposit is, is you, the depositor, have given the bank a loan. So yeah. if the bank, so, so yeah, so if people have large sums of money in the bank, well, no, no, the bank's not the custodian of your money. Uh, the bank you have given either consciously or unconscious or subconsciously or unconsciously, you've given the bank a loan. And, and obviously with any loan, the counterparty can always default. So, you know, they can default in terms of, uh, uh, you know, going bust, they can default in terms of uh, a bail-in, like what, what happened with Cyprus in 2012, or they could default by, uh, you know, the, the central bank printing too much money and the purchasing power of those dollars, uh, you know, um, that, that actually falls. So, so there's different forms of default. Um, but if anyone thinks that having their money in the bank uh, is a safe venture, you uh, have actually given a, effectively a commercial loan to the bank um, and, and on pretty crappy terms, to be honest, in terms of in terms of a very low interest rate, uh, but the, you hold all the risk, uh, and um, and we know throughout history that um, uh, those risks uh, sometimes uh, lead to life changing consequences uh, on the downside, and uh, people should um, you know obviously uh, broaden their education and, and broaden their approaches to uh, potentially how to manage the coming crisis. What a shame you weren't around when George Von Trapp uh, was around. You might have been able to provide him with some uh, wonderful advice at the time. Um, John, once again, thank you so much for your input today. Always appreciated. Um, thank you for sharing The Sound of Music with us. Uh, it's a totally different slant on it and a far more accurate one. Um, a reminder once again, of course, just quickly, our GFC 2.0, um, big event coming up, just a few seats left. Um, love to see you there. It'll just be a fantastic series of events. I'll just quote the dates again. Melbourne, Saturday, April 27. Sydney, Saturday, May 4. And Adelaide is a Wednesday evening, May 15. Three days before the, uh, the election, John. Uh, that'll be interesting. Um, John, of course, our main keynote speaker. Um, details, details on link below. And finally, and most importantly, thank you to all of our subscribers. We really appreciate your support. Until next time, stay well, stay focused, and bye for now. Bye for now, John. Thanks, thank John. you, sir.